So if you've been following along this little video series on natural language processing, then you've seen this figure before. And really what we're doing today is we're starting to get to some of the higher level parts here, specifically looking at representations that can start to capture something that looks like meaning. And in particular, we're going to look at word embeddings. These are vector representations of word classes. And it was something that really revolutionized natural language processing when it started being used in the early 2010s. So I'll just start with a little bit of a motivation, explaining the limitations of some of the models that we've looked at up to now. So um, let's say we've got the sentence, lions are beautiful. And maybe the next word can be something like cats, or maybe it can be something like feline. Okay, And in an n-gram language model, what we would do is we would basically count up how likely is cat to follow some of the preceding words, or how likely is feline to follow some of the preceding words. Let me just make that a little bit more concrete and then also use this as an illustration um, of the limitations of some of the models that we've looked at. What we would typically do, for instance, when we were still using uh, MATLAB for some reason, MATLAB is really, really bad with um, dealing with strings. So this first step that you would normally do is you would map each word category, each word type, or each word class, you would map that to a unique integer value. Um, and then in MATLAB, you would basically just store a list of, oh, word zero is this word, word one is this word. Um, and then you could just deal with these integers, which MATLAB is good at, um, instead of um, dealing with the, with the strings directly. You would also maybe do this in C++, where it can also be quite tricky to work with strings. So for instance, you would have that the very first word in your, um, in your vocabulary, that might be the start of sentence symbol. The second word or the word with ID1 might be the word, and this is actually very often the word artvark, which actually is Afrikaans word, I think, or a Dutch word. Um, then maybe the second word or word with ID2 is R, and then the third word is at, and so on. Okay, maybe word eight is cats. Maybe word 11 is feline. And maybe we've got roughly 50,000 words in our vocabulary, so we end up with the second last word too, and then maybe the very, very large last word in our vocabulary is the end of sentence um, symbol. Okay, and then what you would do is you would map your data basically to these integers. Okay, so line might be, I don't know, 416, R is 2, beautiful is some other number, I don't know, 5, cats is 8, and feline is 11. Okay, and then what you would do for an n-gram language model, for instance, and let's do the example of a four-gram, where we predict a word based on the three um, previous words, then we would maybe count up, well, how often do we see the sequence lions are beautiful cats, okay? But we would count it in this way, where we would store the count of 4016, followed by 2, followed by 5, followed by 8. Okay, um, or for for feline we might store the count um, four oh one six two five eleven. Okay, and we would store these counts. And then if we want, for instance, the probability uh, of cats being preceded by lions are beautiful. I really like cats. Never thought I did, but then we got one in the COVID years, and um, now I really like Luna. Okay, so if we want the probability of cats, given that lions are beautiful, then we would do the count of something divided by the count of something. And in this case, the something would be 4016258 divided by the number of times we see lions are beautiful. Okay. That's how we would estimate this probability, maybe with some discounting, some fancy stuff if you're into that. Um, but that's basically the, the basic idea. Okay, and similarly with feline. The problem is feline might be quite rare in this context. It makes sense, but it might be quite rare. Um, and so maybe this probability is quite low. 
we could address that with um, with maybe with discounting or back off some of the more complicated methods. But the problem is that this approach fundamentally ignores that there's some subtle relationship between felines and cats. Okay, C cats is a type of feline. Um, lions are as well. And the fundamental problem that I'm trying to illustrate with this kind of weird example is that if you think of each of the words in my vocabulary at, as this discrete thing, as this discrete integer value or integer category, then you can actually not model anything very subtle. You can maybe count, count up how often things occur, but you're quite limited in what you can do because you are thinking of words as these discrete categories. So the idea behind word embeddings is to move away from representing words as just discrete things. Okay, instead of thinking of word types as just these discrete categories, we're going to do something a little bit more intricate. And specifically, what we're going to do is each word type, like cats, for instance, is going to be assigned a continuous vector. So it's going to be some vector in a some high dimensional space. I always think of my vectors as, as column vectors. I'll just put a transpose here. And this vector can live in a high dimensional, d dimensional space. Similarly, we would have a vector for the word feline, again, in this um, high dimensional space. And the relationship between these two high dimensional vectors, they should tell me something about cats and feline. Okay, and now because we're not thinking of these things as discrete categories, just like one integer number, but we have a continuous vector, we can model subtle relationships between different words. So for instance, cats and feline might be vectors that are quite far away from a completely unrelated word like, I don't know, liar. Okay, I'm saying they're unrelated, but if you've watched The Lion King, then maybe liars and lions, there's some very complicated relationship there. Okay, um, but this is basically the, the, the intuition behind word embeddings, which would be instead of discrete categories, have these continuous representations of words. Let's just pretend for the second that, that the words are um, in two dimensions. Then maybe you end up with a two dimensional space where words like cats and feline and lions and maybe even cheetahs. Um, end up in one little spot in the space, while other words like liar and maybe lying or lie, joker, um, they end up in a different area in the space. And then maybe we've got some other words here that are also semantically related. And very often it actually turns out that these um, word embeddings, they actually end up encoding meaning in this way where they where words that are related in meaning end up in a similar spot in um, this embedding space. We'll actually look at ways to visualize um, word embeddings as well. I hope that gives you an intuition for, for the reason that we're looking at word embeddings as a way to model some su subtle things in um, natural language processing. I should add, it's pretty cool if you have a continuous representation of a word because then you can feed these representations into a standard machine learning model, something like a support vector machine um, or something like a neural network that actually operates on continuous um, um, representations. And we'll see some examples of that.